We're going to be joined in the next segment. Michael Snyder is going to join us from the economiccollapseblog.com. Now, we cover a lot of his articles. Uh, also, uh, End of the American Dream is another website that he uh, writes on and publishes articles from. Here's some, a sample of just some of the articles that he's had in the last week. Why is NASA working on a way to destroy asteroids using nuclear weapons? Does the IMF actually want to cause a Greek debt default? Warren Buffett says derivatives are still weapons of mass destruction and they're likely to cause big trouble. Twelve signs the U.S. and China are moving towards war. And then one, Lindsey Williams, Martin Armstrong, and Alex Jones all warn about what is coming in the fall of 2015. We're going to talk to him in the next segment. This segment, I want to talk a little bit about the war on the press because that is key for the people who are, it's, it's an information war, folks. We talk about this all the time. And one of the ways that they're going to win the war is that they keep us in the dark if they keep us ignorant. Here's an article from Reason, how the feds asked me to rat out commentators. And this is kind of interesting. They had a, uh, a comment on May 31st. He blogged about a life sentence that was given to Ross Ulbricht, the creator of the dark website Silk Road. Now, we've interviewed his mother several times. We talked about that. Of course, he was given a draconian sentence of life in prison. In the comment section, a lot of people were angry at the judge, Catherine Forrest. In the comment section, he said there's half dozen commenters unloaded on the judge, suggesting, among other things, that she should burn in hell, be taken out and shot. Another one uh, in an internet homage to the Coen brothers said she ought to be fed feet first into a wood chipper. Of course, that's referring to the movie Fargo. He says, for starters, the subpoena was unnecessary because the comments obviously were not real. One of the commenters uh, scooped up in this, had written, I hope there's a special place in hell reserved for that horrible woman. Now, think about it, that the government would demand to know who this is when somebody makes a hyperbolic comment like that. Does, do you find that frightening? Okay, well, then look at what happened to James O'Keefe. He got stopped coming back into the country. This is an article we have up on Infowars.com. Customs agents stopped him. Uh, he had said, why am I being singled out? Why am I being detained? And of course, they said, well, it's because you crossed the border and filmed yourself doing it without our permission. And then, of course, they show a picture of a big X on his uh, documents there that they, uh, they put in there. And they said, you're going to be stopped every time you come through the border. I guess that'll teach him, won't it? Okay, so another intimidation. And then, of course, there's this as well. We see yesterday... The Department of Defense outlined laws of war and came up with an interesting label. So they've got three different categories. This is a, a large document, a very, very large document uh, just written. The Department of Defense Law of War Manual, uh, I think is about a thousand pages. And basically they break down uh, the legal guidelines for all the branches of the military. When they get to the section on journalists, and it's kind of interesting that they would even add a section on journalists, they break down journalists into three categories, essentially. Members of the armed forces, so there's uh, then those who are authorized to accompany the armed forces, those who are embedded, and then unprivileged belligerents. So you're either with us or you're an unprivileged belligerent because you're either military or you're embedded with the military as a reporter or you are an unprivileged belligerent. What is an unprivileged belligerent? Well, an unprivileged belligerent is somebody who is essentially in the past has been a spy. That's the way they view journalists that are not under their control, a potential spy, a potential risk, a security threat. There's two sections for those people. Journalists, and the first, the, the section of 4.24.4 says journalists and spying. See, you're a spy if you're not embedded with them. So to avoid being mistaken for spies, journalists should act openly and with the permission of the authorities. Same thing goes for the next section, security precautions. See, states may need to censor journalists, so they need to make sure at all times they have the permission of the government. Sorry, First Amendment doesn't stay that, say that. Stay with us. We're going to be right back with Michael Snyder. Here in Austin, we're joined now by Michael Snyder, and Michael Snyder is uh, someone that we have included his articles frequently on Infowars.com. We have uh, just a sample of a uh, couple of articles in the last few days. Why is NASA working on a way to destroy asteroids using nuclear weapons? Does the IMF actually want to cause a Greek debt default? Uh, Lindsey Williams, Martin Armstrong, and Alex Jones all warn about what's coming in the fall of 2015. 
So we're going to be talking to uh, Michael Snyder. I want to go to him in just a moment. Before I do, we've been talking about how we're trying to grow this operation, how we're in a fight to stop the uh, effects of TPP. If we can't completely stop TP from pass, TPP from passing, uh, the fast track has gone through. It's going to be more difficult to stop it. We're going to have to fight harder than ever. One way that you can do this, of course, is to follow us at Prison Planet TV. Become a subscriber. Support our operation. There's no question that we're making a difference, but you can make a difference if you support us financially. If you become a subscriber, you don't have to wait for low-quality uploads on YouTube that are going to come out the next day. You can just log in. You can watch it on HD. You can watch it live right now. You can try it for 14 days. If you like it, it's only $5 a month, and it supports our entire operation here. So that's one way that you can join the fight. It's one way that you can educate other people. And, of course, uh, we have many different ways to educate people. One of those is Michael Snyder's articles that we post up on Infowars.com. He's the creator of the EconomicCollapseBlog.com. He is not a member of any political party, he points out, or any political organization. He is very pessimistic about what's going on. I should say bearish is probably a better word. Uh, he also writes endoftheamericandream.com, thetruthwins.com. There's a positive one for you. Author of two books, Beginning of the End and Get Prepared. See, if you're looking at this from a bearish perspective, just like Max Kaiser, we had him on a couple of days ago. He's a bear. He's got that on his uh, social media, his website. He's got a picture of a bear behind his picture. That's preparing for the worst case scenario. That's what we really need to prepare for. So joining us now is Michael Snyder. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. It's a real privilege to be on with you. We read your articles all the time, so it's interesting to see what you look like and to get a chance to talk to you. What do you want to cover first? Because uh, we've just seen the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, not partnership, I make that mistake again. We saw the fast track go through. We're going to see these uh, trade treaties that they've been working on. They're going to try to ram them through very rapidly. Uh, what is your feeling on this? What's your take? Yeah, well, a lot of people out there have been waiting for the, a one world economic system to come someday. But to me, it's here now. And this is another huge step toward integrating the U.S. economy with the entire globe. In fact, the T TPP will cover 40 percent of the entire GDP of the entire planet. And then the plan is eventually to get China and the EU and everyone else along with the two to make it a truly global treaty. Mm -hmm. well, what this treaty is going to mean is it's going to mean the loss of more jobs, more manufacturing facilities already. We've seen more than 56,000 manufacturing facilities shut down in the United States since 2001. We've lost millions of jobs. We've seen our economic infrastructure act absolutely get gutted. And this is going to take it to an entirely new level. Every single treaty that comes along, whether it's NAFTA, whether it's CAFTA, whatever it is, it's, it's always meant less jobs for American workers. It's always meant more jobs and more businesses going overseas. So this, this is just another step in that direction. And then the other thing that infuriates me about this is that this, see, this treaty is not just about economics and trade. That's only a small part of it. It's also about the environment. It's about intellectual property. It's about the internet. It's about derivatives. It's about education. It's about so many other things that's so true problems. and you know I, the sad thing about it is you, you started out talking about how it is global governance and of course uh senator jeff sessions pointed that out he's uh not anybody who uh believes he's not a 9-11 truther he's not somebody uh that is out there that's been talking about a new world government but he looked at the agreement and he said look they're creating a transnational committee that is going to have the power to write its own laws without any input from us this is global governance. And so when we fight against this just by talking about the negative economic consequences, and we've seen how these uh, economic consequences have worked out for us with NAFTA, if we just fight against it on that basis alone, though, we're fighting at it with one hand behind our back, aren't we? Oh, we absolutely are. And what infuriates me is that the Republicans have been the ones pushing for this, pushing so hard to give Obama this authority to negotiate this this the comprehensive treaty in secrecy. It's an ultra secret treaty. Members of Congress actually have to go into a basement room to read this treaty. They're handed one section at a time where they're able to go through with someone actually looking over their shoulder as they read it. When they're done, they have to hand it back when they leave the room. And when they, they come out of the room and, and go back, 
they're not allowed to tell any of us, they're not allowed to tell the public what's actually in this treaty. So do we still live in a republic? This is so absolutely absurd. And so what Barack Obama is almost assuredly doing is everything he couldn't get through Congress before, everything that he always wanted to do, he's sticking into this treaty, putting into this treaty, and the Republicans are saying, yeah, we let's go ahead and give him this authority to negotiate this super huge treaty, which is gonna lock us in. And then this treaty is going to say the only way that it can be changed is with the permission of all the other countries that yeah. are parties to the treaty. So it's, it's really insidious. Well, with the permission of that uh, transnational committee, which presumes to represent all those other countries. You know, one of the things that we need to do, I think, Michael, is we need to, the Republicans are signing on to this. In many cases, the rank and file say, well, I support free trade. They need to understand this is not free trade. Any more than crony capitalism and what we saw happen with the banks, that's not a free market, okay? So understand, this is not free trade by any stretch of the imagination. And they also need to understand, I think you're talking about all these different issues that are already a part of it based on the leaks that we've seen. They can bring in things like gun control. We've seen the UN Arms Trade Treaty that Obama is desperate to pass, that John Kerry said he signed on behalf of the American people. Of course, we had Senator Corker from Tennessee say, I'm sorry, that's not the way the law works. But they are willing to you know, bend the Constitution to their will. We see this over and over again. We just saw it in the Supreme Court decision today. It doesn't matter what the language says, they're going to use any kind of pretense or prevarication to do what they want to do. So we should be very concerned and we ought to get Republicans on board with this saying, look, this is going to affect gun control quite possibly. This is something that's been going down the pike for several years as well. Yeah, absolutely. We truly have become a lawless land. And we saw this with the Supreme Court decision today uh, about Obamacare, with Chief Justice Roberts once again stepping up to defend Obamacare. And I warned at the time he was nominated, this is a progressive. This is not someone that has a respect for a constitution, but all the conservatives out there, because he was nominated by a Republican, they thought, oh, this is a good justice. He's gonna stand up for the constitution. But that I said, no, that's not gonna be the case. And that's turned out not to be the case. Now, yeah. what a lot of people out there may not realize is that I actually have a law degree. I went to law school, the University of Florida Law School, and then I went on to practice law right in the heart of Washington, D.C., down on K Street. And what people need to realize is that in our law schools all over this country and courts all over this land, a lot of times these court decisions, these judges, what they do is they decide what they want to rule, how they want to rule, and then they fish for any kind of possible justification they can to come to that end result. Oh, That's absolutely. what we've seen with this latest decision, and, and we've seen it with a whole series of decisions. So, we, you know, the, the respect for con the Constitution has really gone out the window. Oh, absolutely. Drudge had a uh, article up yesterday talking about how the Supreme Court under Roberts had moved quite a bit to the left, and they, they uh, ranked it by all these different... Uh, decisions, and that was before today's uh, move. And so Drudge put that up as a headline today, the court swings far to the left. I think that's really true, and it underscores the nonsense of thinking that uh, you're going to, um, uh, that the Republican Party, that a Supreme Court nominee from a Republican president are going to vote the way you want them to vote. Look, these guys are tools of the corporations. Take a look at the Keystone Pipeline, for example. Okay, the Republicans have passed that 10 times. They still haven't gotten it through, but they've passed that 10 times. And we could have a discussion about uh, oil and about pollution and sources of oil and that kind of stuff. But the thing that concerns me about the Keystone Pipeline, again, is this supranational idea that the corporations rule. And you can see that already as they got close to passing this. They gave TransCanada, which is running the Keystone Pipeline, they gave them eminent domain to condemn and seize the farms of people who are going to be in the path of the pipeline. People who've had this, the farms in their uh, family for over 100 years, they gave that to a corporation. This is far beyond the Kello decision, where the Supreme, which the Supreme Court uh, said was okay, where they had a local government take from one individual and give to another individual private property, not for public use, but for private use. Now, this is something that is uh, giving, not only extending that, but extending it to a foreign corporation, giving the foreign corporation the power to condemn and to take for that private, that uh, corporation's benefit. 
That's amazing to me. But we see the Republicans lining up to do that. We see the Republicans refusing to take on Obamacare. And we see the Supreme Court saying, hey, you know, this would be a difficult thing if we had to actually rewrite the law to do what we wanted to do. So let's just have the Supreme Court wave their magic wand over it and say these words don't mean what these words mean. Oh, absolutely. And when I was in law school, when people go to law school, uh, most Americans don't realize, but our law students are being taught and trained that the Constitution is a living, breathing document. In other mm -hmm. words, that it, it it can change with the times. That 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 you know, and 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 the attitude that we are we law students are taught in law school is that we know better than those who framed the Constitution. We know better than previous generations of Americans. We're progressing toward the future. Essentially, law schools are kind of seminaries for progressives in which um, we're, we're ingrained with progressivism. Now, of course, I never embraced that, but I saw it happening all around me. And oh, yeah. all of my law professors, almost every single one was a hardcore progressive. Hang and on, so hang on right there, we gotta go to break. Michael Snyder will be right back. We're gonna talk about postmodernism, the malleable constitution. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight in Austin, and we're joined by Michael Snyder, an author that we pick up frequently at Infowars.com. He writes for the Economic Collapse Blog.com, and we're going to talk to him about economic collapse, what he sees in the near future, his concerns, and also what he thinks the timing may be. In the last segment, we were talking about the Supreme Court decision that just came out in terms of uh, Obamacare, as uh, Justice Scalia said, let's call it uh, SCOTUS care, because they are essentially writing the laws and moving the words of the law to suit themselves. He said it's not a malleable document, and uh, Michael is a lawyer by training, and he was just talking about how they're training the lawyers in law school now to see the Constitution as a living document. Jeff Sessions is a lawyer. He's a judge, and he looked at the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and he was appalled by the fact that it itself was a living document, something that could be infinitely changed without uh, any due process by any involvement by any of the nations that had signed on to it. It was going to be a transnational committee that was going to be free to change this. Of course, they're going to present it as a complete package to the uh, House and to the Senate, once it is passed, and they're not going to be able to make any amendments, once it is passed, that international committee is going to be able to change it at will. But I want to get back to what you were talking about, because it was uh, exactly what Scalia was talking about today, how they're teaching the uh, law school students that the Constitution is a malleable document, kind of this postmodern uh, subjective uh, uh, outlook on it. Yeah, and if you go to and look at federal court decisions today, sometimes they even go to international law or international standards of morality, they call it, to, to justify their decisions. They even go outside of the United States. So anything they can reach for and grasp, and they, they talk about changing public uh, values, changing public opinions. And so I expect to see something similar within the next few days regarding the uh, upcoming decision about gay marriage, which I fully expect to be declared a constitutional right, even though the Constitution says nothing of the sort, no language in there which could possibly be used to justify such a thing. But I fully expect that it will be termed a fundamental right will, will be the technical language that will be used. And I fully expect the, the Supreme Court to make it the law of the land in all 50 states. But not. But the, the reason they're doing it is because that's the decision they want to come to. Yes. And I believe Justice Roberts will once again uh, side on that. And, and But they're, they're, they're making things up out of thin air. That's what people need to realize. <laughs> Yeah, the Constitution says that uh, the central government doesn't have any powers unless they are explicitly granted to it. And of course, they will play games with things like the Commerce Clause, which I, I kind of find interesting, Michael, because, you know, the Commerce Clause was originally there to create free trade. You know, it was originally there to stop the different states from imposing taxes as goods were crossing from, let's say, Texas into Oklahoma. They were going to say, no, Oklahoma is not going to be able to put an import tax on those goods. So they put the Commerce Clause in there to create free trade. And the government has turned that on its head and used it to not only uh, control trade, but to 
involve themselves in pretty much every aspect of our lives. And of course, that's the kind of prevarications, the kind of lies and perversions that they use. There's absolutely nothing in the Constitution that gives the government, uh, the central government, control over defining marriage. Of course, they don't even have any control over prohibiting drugs. They had to have a, a constitutional amendment to prohibit alcohol and then another one to make it legal again. At least in the early 20th century, we had people in Washington who paid respect to the formalities of the law. We no longer have that. If they don't want you to have something, they just say you can't have it. If they want you to buy a product from one of their corporate sponsors, they mandate it. That's where we are today. Oh, absolutely. And you know, it's absolutely insane what's happening you know, to uh, our, the Constitution and to the rule of law. And, and, and uh, you know, I think it's only going to get worse. I recently wrote an article about the emergency powers that our presidents have, and Obama has more than ever before. And federal courts have consistently sided with the presidency, even though the Constitution says nothing about emergency powers. But today, Barack Obama is the most uh, powerful president in all of U.S. history, thanks not only to executive orders, but statu uh, uh, statutory law and, and a whole bunch of other things and precedents that have been set in courts. Uh, if we have a major national emergency, it's at the point where the groundwork has already been laid for Barack Obama to essentially be a dictator and take control of basically whatever he wants and to do basically whatever he wants. All we need is at one major national crisis and he already has the groundwork, the legal authority, although he really, you know, according to the Constitution, he wouldn't. But the groundwork has been laid in the courts for him to take control, basically, of everything. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And that's what you wind up with when you throw out the objective truth of written law and you make it a living document. Then it is whatever the people say it is. It's whatever the leader says it is. That's the definition of a dictator. Stay with us. We're going to be right back with Michael Snyder. We're going to talk about what he sees as the coming collapse as well as the timing. We're we'll on the right. Let's go to uh, Michael Snyder. Michael, uh, you're looking at, uh, you believe that there's going to be an economic collapse soon. You take a bearish outlook on things. You prepare for the future. What do you see coming and when do you see it coming? Well, as a lawyer, I was trained to be level headed. As a lawyer, I was trained to come to conclusions based on the evidence. Now, I've been doing the economic collapse blog.com since 2009. And all during that time, I've never issued any kind of alert uh, of any sort. But today, on the Alex Jones show, I am announcing that I am issuing a red alert for the last six months of 2015. Mm. I believe that a financial collapse similar to what we saw back in 2008, a global financial collapse is imminent. And when I say imminent, I don't believe I'm not saying in the next 48 hours. What I'm saying is within the next six months, I believe we have entered, a, we are entering a danger zone similar to what we entered in 2008, I believe that we are looking at the one of the greatest financial bubbles in all of history, and I believe it's about to burst. Yeah, it certainly looks like that from the preparations that our government has been making. Either they are the most paranoid people the planet has ever seen, or they've been seeing some kind of an economic collapse coming for quite some time. And we saw this a couple of years ago when they started buying massive quantities of ammunition. And of course, it was hollow point ammunition, which is outlawed for use by the military, but it's permitted for use against civilian populations by governments. And it's also the most expensive ammunition that you can buy. So they're not getting it for target practice. So we saw them stockpiling that. We see them pushing out military equipment to all of the uh, Mayberry uh, police departments, all the small town police departments, getting these uh, MRAPs and uh, armored vehicles, militarizing the police. It certainly looks like they are preparing either for a collapse or a crackdown. Yeah, and uh, if you just look at the technical indicators, my undergraduate degree before I went to law school, my undergraduate degree is actually in business. And in business school, if, if you took the last six months of what's happened in the financial world, it would be a textbook case for a run up to a stock market crash. For example, if you look at the Buffett indicator, it's a ratio of corporate equities to GDP. 
It's the highest it's ever been in modern American history. The only time, except for one time, the only time it's been higher was right before the dot-com bubble burst in the year 2000. Or if you look at price to earnings ratios, right now the price to earnings ratios over the last six months, the only times they've ever been higher in all of US history were in 1929, right before the stock market crashed, and in the year 2000, right before the stock market crashed. We're higher than we were uh, even before the, the 2008 crash. Or if you uh, take a look at margin debt, in all of uh, modern American history, there's been three great peaks of margin debt. In other words, people are borrowing awesome, tremendous amounts of money to buy stocks with, which is a really bad idea, but they're doing it. The first major peak was right before the dot-com bubble burst. It peaked like crazy, and then, and then the market crashed. It peaked right before the 2008 crash, we saw a massive peak in margin debt, then the market crashed. And now the third great peak, in fact, it recently hit a brand new record high. We're also seeing a great divergence between the S&P 500 and high yield credit or uh, high yield bonds. This is something we saw in the run up to 2008 crash, where usually uh, junk bonds and the stock market, they track each other very closely. But then leading up to 2008, we saw, it, saw them start to diverge. The stock market kept going up while the junk bonds started to fall ahead of the crash. And so that's happening again. And we're so, seeing so many other of these indicators, like just like we saw in 2008, where we've had an oil uh, uh, price crash. Um, we've seen um, uh, a whole bunch of these other indicators start to happen with the US dollar rising, commodities uh, prices going down. So many of them um, that have happened before that are happening once again. So leading up to this, it, it's a textbook case uh, for for what we would expect leading up to a stock market crash. And you know, you had a, uh, over the weekend, we had an article that uh, you had written that we put up on Infowars.com. Lindsey Williams, Martin Armstrong, and Alex Jones all warn about what is coming in the fall of 2015. And of course, Alex had interviewed Martin Armstrong, he predicted very accurately uh, uh, previous market activity with his econometric model. Uh, we had that video, and, and when you look at what's happening, when you look at the all the different indicators that you're looking at, and even the broader, simpler indicators of the fact that uh, they keep pumping money into the world economy and it isn't doing anything, it's just laying there dead. They can't take the interest rates any lower to stimulate the economy. They're talking about negative interest rates. They're talking about currency controls. They're getting very desperate. We see this happening across the board. People who don't own stocks need to understand that if you even have any money that's going to get locked up if we have uh, an economic collapse like this, they're already putting the pieces into place to lock up your cash, to confiscate confiscate your cash out of the um, out of your bank account. That's what people are afraid of in Greece. That's why they pulled out over 4 billion euros in just one week in Greece, because they thought that was going to happen this last week. We still don't know what's going to happen in Greece. Oh, absolutely. And but the, what's happening in Greece now is just a preview of what's coming to yes. the entire planet. Here in the United States, the as you mentioned, the velocity of money has dropped to the lowest level in modern American history. Normally in a healthy economy, money flows very freely. I buy something from you, you buy something from someone else and money circulates. But in an unhealthy economy, the velocity of money goes down. And we've seen the velocity of money keep dropping and dropping and dropping. Now it's the lowest level it's been in, in modern American history. And so, yes, as you mentioned, we've seen so many others start to say, start to point to the last half of this year. Lindsey Williams, he recently uh, said this, quote, my elite friend indicated that we that, that, that they have a worldwide financial collapse scheduled between September and the end of December 2015. Martin Armstrong, as you mentioned, he's been pointing to the year 2015.75 is what he calls it, referring to the fall of this year. He's been pointing to that, his, his economic model has been pointing to that for decades, actually, mm. to, to this moment that's coming up. Um, Alex Jones recently issued a, a video warning which went viral all over the world warning about what's coming next. Uh, 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 Bible prophecy expert Joel Rosenberg, uh, he recently uh, issued a, a, a warning in which he, he said, quote, something is coming, I don't know what, but we all must be ready in every possible way. So it's not just me that's pointing to what's ahead. 
but uh, I, all over the internet, prominent voices are speaking out. Things I've been told publicly, things I've been told privately that I can't share at this time. Uh, things, you know, uh, what I'm basing this red alert, I've never done this before, but I'm issuing this red alert, not based on what one or two people are saying, not one, on one or two indicators, but on the totality of what I've learned, the totality of my research, what, what I've been told. I've written more than 1,300 articles on the economic collapse blog alone about the coming financial crisis, but I'm, I, I, I decided this is the moment to warn the people that a financial crisis is imminent, that it's coming. And it's not gonna, uh, our problems are not gonna end at the end of 2015. This is gonna lead into 2016 and beyond. I believe the worst period of time in modern American history is coming. Um, and yes. then as the next few years roll along. Um, and so, you know, I know a lot of people, they've gotten complacent. They don't have a sense of urgency. A lot of preppers, they used to prep. But they say, oh, well, things seem like they're going to be okay, so I'm not going to do that anymore. You get, um, lured, you get lured into this kind of complacency, don't you? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's a normalcy bias where people mm -hmm. think, well, nothing has happened, you know, so nothing is going to happen. But I'm telling you, we're heading for a cliff and we're about to go off. You know, you talked about all these different indications. You talked about how Martin Armstrong's been talking about uh, 2015, uh, 0.75, in other words, last uh, quarter of 2015 for a long time. One of the first reports I did when I came to InfoWars was about a book called The Fourth Turning of Strauss and Howe. I don't know if you've heard of them or not, but of course they have a cyclical uh, 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 interpretation of history and they take it back to the 1600s because, and going through uh, American and English history, looking at this generational cycle. There's like a, you know four generations and like every year, 80 years, they see a massive upheaval, a massive change. They were saying 20 years ago that they were looking at a time frame that was around 2020 for a massive upheaval similar to the Civil War, similar to uh, World War II, similar to the War of Independence. So, you know, they're looking at this type of upheaval. And at the same time, we've been hearing from all these futurists uh, about 2020. 2020 is the year that all the robots are going to be online. We aren't going to have any jobs. I mean, we've seen all of these different projections from so many different corners looking at the time period from about 2015 to 2025 where we're going to see this massive upheaval, massive revolution. So this is coming from a lot of different quarters. Yeah, I even wrote an entire article about economic cycle theories. It's just not a couple of these. There's like, uh, you know, about a six, a six of these major theories, which all point to the period between 2015 and 2020 as a period of extreme upheaval, economic collapse, terrible times. So it's funny how all these uh, theories from actually a secular point of view are pointing to this. Mm -hmm. And then on the alternative end, this uh, the time period also corresponds with them some things that people are pointing to spiritually. For example, we've got the uh, end of the Shemitah cycle. Uh, your, your listener, Many of your listeners are probably familiar with this, the seven-year biblical cycle, which comes every seven years. And the funny thing is at the end of the last two Shemitah cycles, September two, 17, 2001, was the last day of a Shemitah cycle, the seven-year biblical cycle. On the very last day, Elul 29 on the biblical calendar, the day right before Rosh Hashanah, uh, that we saw the greatest one-day stock market crash in all of U.S. history up until that time. Hmm. And that record held for exactly seven years until seven years later, September 29th, 2008. Uh, once again, Elul 29 on the biblical calendar to the day right before Rosh Hashanah, the Dow fell by 777 uh, points. Once again, the greatest stock market crash in all of US history up until that time. Now we're in a new Shemitah cycle. It began last fall. It ends on September 13th, 2015. Now that's a Sunday, so the stock market's not gonna crash on that day, but we're coming up to the end of another one of these cycles. So many people are wondering what's gonna happen. That's very interesting. You know, you had a, uh, when you start talking about uh, uh, cycles and signs. I thought it was very interesting, this article that you had uh, uh, just yesterday. Why is NASA 
working on a way to destroy asteroids using nuclear weapons. They're working with the National Nuclear Security Administration. I'd never even heard of that, Michael. Uh, they're working on a way uh, straight out of the movies, as you pointed out, uh, Armageddon and these other movies from uh, 10, 20 years ago where they would uh, send a crew up to uh, uh, put nuclear explosives on an asteroid that was headed towards the Earth. Apparently, uh, they're, they're working on this now. This is reported by the, wasn't it, the New York Times that reported this? Yeah, the New York Times reported how NASA is teaming up with the National Nuclear Security Administration to figure out a way to use nuclear weapons against asteroids. Well, immediately I had flashbacks to Deep Impact and Armageddon, a couple movies I loved back in the 1990s. Yeah. But this seems very, very strange to me because just a couple weeks ago, NASA came out and said uh, they, they held a, a, a whole deal where they, they came out and announced, publicly announced, quote, no asteroid or comet cur is currently on a collision course with Earth. And they also said, <laughs> quote, no large object is likely to strike the Earth anytime in the next several hundred years. So that's what they said publicly, but then they're all of a sudden they're trying to figure out a way to destroy asteroids with nuclear weapons. Well, that would seem to me that that's a, a tremendous waste of time, effort, and money if there's absolutely no threat out there at all. And yeah. actually, earlier this year, NASA held a whole big uh, practice scenario about what would happen if an asteroid was, was coming. So it seems like their actions and their words aren't quite matching up. It's interesting when they make that pronouncement uh, uninvited. Oh, I just want to let you know, you don't have anything to worry about this. I mean, while they're training for that. Stay with us. We're going to talk to Michael Schneider about what you can do. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Martin, I'm uh, sorry, Michael Snyder. I'm looking at Martin Armstrong's predictions here. Michael Snyder is joining us from the economiccollapseblog.com. He's a frequent contributor to Infowars.com. We've been talking about some of his recent articles. And of course, in the last segment, we were talking about how uh, technocrats and globalists like uh, Ray Kurzweil have been looking forward to the time frame between 2015 and 2025, where they were going to see massive societal change. We've seen the same thing from people who observe uh, cycles of history, cycles within society. People like Strauss and Howe, who wrote The Fourth Turning, The Fourth Turning being uh, the fourth generation where you have massive upheaval, usually resulting, not always, but usually resulting in a massive war, something like World War II. And then, of course, we also have different economic indicators that are all lining up. That was what Michael Snyder was just talking about, Martin Armstrong's cycles, all the different uh, stock market indicators that start to point to an economic collapse this year, the latter part of the fall, as well as some of the biblical cycles pointing to this uh, upcoming September as being a significant time. So I want to talk to you, Michael, about what people should do to prepare. Give us an idea, because you've been thinking about this. You are a bear on this. You are preparing uh, uh, what to do. You, you wrote a book called Get Prepared. Tell us what to do, uh, what, what people should be doing to prepare for this kind of upheaval. Yeah, in order to get prepared, a lot of it is common sense. For example, I encourage people to have an emergency fund that can cover at least six months of your bills so that if you do lose a job, if your business goes sour, that you're going to be able to pay the mortgage, you're going to be able to pay the bills, you're going to be able to survive in the midst of chaos all around us. You know, because a survey came out just the other day, 30% of Americans don't have a single penny of savings, of emergency savings. So when the crisis comes, what's going to happen to them? They're going to be, it's, it's going to be a disaster almost immediately. I'm also a big believer in storing up food and, and uh, supplies and everything that you would need for a longer term crisis. Now that's a little bit more down the road, but I'm a big believer of that. And anything you can do to become more independent of the system, learning to grow a garden, that's a way to become less dependent on the system, having your own fruits and vegetables so you don't have to go and get them uh, at the store, whatever you can do for home security and self-defense. I believe we're moving into a time we're going to see great civil unrest in our cities. Crime is going to rise. People are going to become more desperate. So you need to start thinking about how, what are you going to do for your own home defense, things of that nature. But then let me talk about financial preparation, because that's what a lot of people are concerned about. Our banking system, our financial system is extremely vulnerable. So you don't want to be exposed to the stock market. You don't want to be have a retirement plan, which is potentially exposed. And you don't want to put all of your eggs in one basket or one bank. Because let me tell you a little bit about the banks. Today, um, you know, the last crisis, the banks were played a starring role in it. They're right at the center. And we are told the problem of too big to fail would be solved. Well, unfortunately, it hasn't been solved. In fact, it's gotten even worse. In fact, since the last crisis, 
the four largest banks in the United States have collectively gotten 40% larger. Meanwhile, 1,400 smaller banks have totally gone out of existence. So the problem of too big to fail is now greater than ever. But meanwhile, these big banks, you know, they're so important. They made mistakes last time. You think they would learn their lessons? No. Instead, they become far more reckless than ever. In fact, the there's the uh, five of the two big to fail banks. I'm talking about J.P. Morgan Chase, Citibank, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley. Each one of them has exposure to derivatives of at least thirty-eight trillion dollars. Mm. J.P. Morgan Chase, the biggest, has total exposure to derivatives of more than sixty-three trillion dollars, while they only have total assets of about two point six trillion dollars. Amazing! So that very important right. information. We're out of time, Michael. I wish we had more time. Michael Snyder, the Economic Collapse Blog.com, and of course you can catch him on Infowars.com frequently. Tonight's nightly news. Thank you for joining us, Michael. Tonight's nightly news. Michael uh, Derek Green will be hosting. Join us then. You are listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today.